Good morning everyone. We're starting off the day with a little hike. It's about 2.8 miles round trip, I think. And it's an out and back hike, so 1.4 miles there and 1.4 miles back. And the trail goes somewhere over here, I think. I think that's our destination in the distance. We're not quite there yet, but uh, we're getting close and you can, uh, you can see our destination right here. This natural arch right here is called Rifle Arch. And I also wanted to show you this big cliff right here. This is about four or 500 feet high and is a popular rock climbing destination. And my understanding is that more people use this trail to actually get to the cliffs to go climbing than to actually see the, uh, the natural arch, but we're gonna go head toward the arch. We're almost there. Let's see if we can't get a little bit closer. If I were to pick a theme for what we're going to be seeing and doing today, it would be things that I didn't know existed until the last month or so. And I'm surprised I didn't know about this arch earlier because it's not a small arch. The opening here is about 60 feet high and 150 feet across. So half the length of a football field in length. That's pretty darn neat, pretty darn impressive. And here's looking out from about as far back as I can go behind the arch. The hike was nice getting here, just through this nice semi-wooded pinion juniper scrubland. And the arch itself is fairly thick on top. When you're right underneath it, it's very thin. It's a little sliver from in front and behind. It's a little bit thicker. I never get tired of seeing arches. I've seen, I don't know, hundreds at this point, but there's just something magical about these natural formations that are just so improbable and so unique and so beautiful. Believe it or not, I found out about this arch just about a week ago, and I found it just from browsing Google Maps. Google Maps is a surprisingly good resource for finding points of interest like this. And as time goes on, more and more of these places are marked and uh, it's really pretty amazing what things you can find on there. Uh, it is now eight o'clock on the dot. I have about 40 or 45 minutes of hiking to do to get back to the car. And the hike, by the way, really wasn't too bad until this little final section. Uh, you could get to the point where there were good views of the arch pretty easily but then to actually get to the arch and under the arch and behind the arch, uh, that involved some pretty steep uh, scrambling and, and, sw and switchbacking on. Not much of a trail, so just bear that in mind. But anyway, gonna hike back to the car and I think from there it's about an hour long drive uh, to destination number two of the day and this one is super interesting. So I'll see you there. Okay, so let me tell you a story. In 1973, the US government, along with a couple of, of private companies, wanted to see if it was possible to extract natural gas by setting off nuclear bombs underground. And so a hole was drilled here, uh, more than a mile deep, and three bombs, three 33 kiloton bombs were placed down there. 
and they were detonated. And I might have this wrong, but I think a kiloton is the equivalent of a thousand tons of TNT. So it was a 33 kiloton bomb, meaning the equivalent of 33 tons of TNT or dynamite or something like that. I don't know. I don't know if that's right or not. But yeah, they wanted to see if it was possible to use bombs like that to extract natural gas from underground in areas where there was a thick layer of, of otherwise pretty impermeable bedrock. And so they did that, and the result was that they were able to collect some natural gas, the natural ga gas collected in those uh, in the spaces left by the bombs, but the resulting natural gas was radioactive, maybe unsurprisingly, and so it wasn't a commercially viable project. And so this spot where I am is where those bomb detonations took place. It was called Project Rio Blanco, and there's not much here to see or to look at. There is a little concrete plaque here. Basically it says some of what I just told you, and then uh, the majority of it says to not collect materials from this area or from underneath uh, the ground. And then there is what looks like some sort of drilling equipment over here. Let's go check that out. Let's see. I don't know my drilling equipment. I don't know what I'm looking at here. But uh, maybe you guys know. Again, let me know in the comments if you have an idea of what exactly this is. I mean, it looks like the, the cap to a, a drill hole, maybe? I don't know. There were, by the way, a few of these, these underground nuclear test sites in the, in the West uh, in the 1960s and 70s. This is one, I think the last of those. So the thing that I wanted to know is, is this ground radioactive? And so for that, I came prepared. I bought and I brought with me a Geiger counter. This was 50 or $60 off of Amazon. I will probably never use this for anything else, but I thought it would be worth it to, to get it just for this adventure. Now to have kind of a, a baseline, I've been checking the, the radiation levels of various places, uh, both today and also about a month ago when I was also in this general area within, you know, an hour or two of this spot, when I was actually going to originally visit this spot, but I got sidetracked by other things. And so let me, uh, let me take out my phone here. Okay, so I, I have my notes of the radiation levels of the other spots that I recorded the levels at, and the readings were 25, 46, 35, 26, and 30. So basically the highest was 46 and the rest were in the 20s and 30s. Now, according to this little handy dandy card that came with the Geiger counter, let's see, you can see on the far left there, that far left column has the number, the CPM, and if it's between five and 50, then it's normal background radiation, no action is required. And so if it's above 50, things get uh, progressively worse from there. I've put this on the ground here, let's, turn this on and then it, it starts counting up. It starts at zero and one and then it slowly counts up. So let's give this a few minutes and uh, see how it goes. So I think CPM is, I don't remember exactly what it stands for, counts per minute or something like that. Basically this number is the, the number of times it senses radioactivity per minute. I think that's right. So again, if it's under 50, that means it's just normal kind of background ambient radiation. And if it's more than that, then, uh, you know, then we start to worry a little bit more. So I will leave that alone for a minute or two, and then we'll go back and check the reading. And the result is 41, 39, 40, 38, 40, 41. So we're jumping around in that, uh, I don't know if you guys can even see this, but 40, 45. I've been checking it off and on, and I've seen it about as low as 30 or 32 and as high as 48. So however you look at it, we are less than 50. We are under 50. Interesting. Very interesting. Let's put the counter over by the drill thing and see if we get a different number. Okay, so once again, pretty normal levels, 33, 34, 35, 34, 33. 
Once again, not too bad. But while waiting to take that reading, I stumbled across one other little thing that I think I'll measure. Once again, this looks like a, a cap of something, <laughs> a well cap, I don't know. Let's uh, set this out and wait one more time. So once again, not a big deal. We're looking at high 30s, low 40s, nothing out of the ordinary. Now the three detonations that took place here, like I think I said, took place more than a mile underground. And so am I surprised that there aren't higher levels of radiation here? Yeah, I am actually. I thought for sure that we'd see something, you know, at least a little bit higher than ordinary, but no, just uh, normal run-of-the-mill radiation levels. But I think our work here is done for the day. We came, we measured, and now on to the next destination. I have one more spot on the agenda for today. Uh, it's a little bit of a drive. It's not too, too far as the crow flies. It's about 10 miles away, but uh, there's no direct line between here and there, no direct road between here and there. Uh, also, one more thing that I wanted to say, if you have ideas for other things I can do with this, like other places I can visit to measure radiation levels, let me know, because now that I have this, I might as well use it somewhere else. Also, really quick, just to clarify, I'm asking for places to test the Geiger counter at that aren't the Trinity test site in New Mexico. That's where the first nuclear bomb, the first atomic bomb, was detonated. And uh, I, I know about that place. I haven't been there. It's only open to the public a couple times a year, and I've never been in that area when it's open. I'd like to get there at some point, but in the meantime, let me know if you have other suggestions, other ideas. As for now, let's drive. What a landscape and what a view. It took a while to get up here. Lots of driving on back roads, but uh, totally worth it. Just really, really incredible views up here. And the impetus for this drive, the reason I thought to come up here was this memorial here. Once again, I found this on Google Maps. And this is a memorial for Clyde W. Dillon. Down here it says, in memory of Clyde W. Dillon of Hutchinson, Kansas, who loved to hunt in these mountains and who lost his life on this ridge in a storm the night of October 5th, 1941. I'll tell you guys the full story in a minute here, but there's, there's a lot going on here. Let's explore and see what we have, what else is here at this memorial. I'm almost afraid to stick my hand in here. There's just a lot of stuff. There's junk, like there's just trash in here. But I see a notebook. There's a few notebooks. At the back here it says, more info about Clyde at ClydeKDillons.com or search Clyde Dillon Memorial on Facebook, please like our page. So I actually went to that website and went to that Facebook page. After I found this spot, I wanted to find out more. Let's see when the most recent person was to, to come here. Let's see, it was two days ago, and then a few days before that, and then four days before that. Looks like people are hunting bears up here. And we have some ammunition here of various kinds, unfired. And that theme continues over to the, the memorial and cross. Here we have some fairly large, some fairly serious ammo here. It's like a hunting tip for, a, for an arrow. What else? Antlers down there. Antlers down here. Beer, horseshoes. So this guy, Clyde Dillon, he was from Kansas, but he liked to come to Colorado to hunt. 
And so he came here at the end of September 1941. That was a little bit before hunting season, but he liked to scope the area before he started hunting. So he was here at the end of September and he set up a couple of camps here. He had a, a high camp on this ridge at this spot. That's why this memorial is here. And uh, today this is a great spot with great views. And so this would have been the case also in 1941. So I can see why he would want to camp here. Just a really, really beautiful area. And then he also had a lower camp, which was a handful of miles back down the ridge, back down the road. And so he was driving his car up this ridge between the two camps and was caught in a snowstorm, an early season snowstorm. He stayed in his car for a while and ran the heater until all the gas ran out of his car. And then apparently he tried to, to get on foot up to this spot, back up to his high camp, but it was a blizzard, it was a whiteout, he couldn't see where he was going. And so he turned around, tried to get back to his car, but down this way, uh, the ridge forks if you're coming from this direction. And he took the wrong fork of the ridge, so he kind of went past where his car was and uh, he didn't make it. He died from exposure or from cold up here and his, his body was found in November, a month or so later after the snow, that early season snow had melted a little bit. Let's once again enjoy the surprisingly beautiful view out here. Before we head back down toward where his lower camp would have been, I want to see if we can find the spot where his body was found, find the spot where he died. Apparently that spot is marked with a pole and there's a hubcap on top of that pole, a hubcap from his car. And uh, again, that spot marks where he unfortunately met his, uh, his early end. And so let's drive back down the ridge a little bit and then uh, find a place to park. I'm now at the spot where the ridge forks. The road follows one of the forks down and I'm going to be following the other fork down on foot. I don't think there's a there's a path there, but maybe maybe there is. I don't know. Oh, actually, yeah, there is. <laughs> there's an old road. Maybe we can follow this all the way there. I'm not sure. Let's keep following it and find out. I left the path back there. The, uh, the GPS coordinates for the, the hubcap are off to the right a little bit of the trail, I think. And so I'm wandering around through the scrub, through the brush, looking for something. I'm not exactly sure what I'm looking for. I'm not sure how, how tall the pole is or if it's visible before you actually get to it. I don't know, but I'll keep you guys posted. Okay, literally two seconds after I said that and filmed that last little clip, I looked over and I saw something shining. I saw a glint in the sun. Let's go take a closer look. Sure enough, we have our pole. It looks like we have our hubcap. I think it's probably nailed on or something. Yep, this is about a foot above my head, but I'll lift you guys up on the tripod give you a better look. And then I just noticed this here. There's a, I don't know if this is stone or if this is concrete, but I think there are letters on here. Oh man, yeah, it's, it's definitely lettering, but it's super hard to see. It's very, kind of faint and faded. There's a, a C here, and I think this is a, a W, but there's not much beyond that. I can't get much beyond that. And then there's another line of something, and then a third line of, again, something. You know, I realize that something like this, like a, an old hubcap on top of a pole, isn't a top tier tourist destination. But it's not always about that, you know? My favorite thing to do is to just explore, just to wander. And the reason for that wandering can really be anything. It can be a, you know, a personal family story like this. It can be something that's of historical interest or quirkiness, a historical oddity like that nuclear bomb site that I, I went to 
earlier. It can be a restaurant that you want to visit. It can be the name of a mountain. Like over here, over this way, there's a mountain called Calamity Mountain. And I thought, you know what? I think I want to go there. And so after I wrap this up, I'm just going to go drive over that mountain because it's an interesting name. It'll probably lead me to an interesting place. It's not always about the destination necessarily. And you always hear that, you know, it's the journey, not the destination. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it isn't. I think a lot of people focus too much on things like visiting the national parks and that sort of thing, but there's plenty of room out here. There's plenty of public land in the West, places that are still interesting, but also quiet and beautiful and that you might just have all to yourself. And I hope that watching this channel uh, not only exposes you to some of those areas, but gives you the the motivation to go find some of those places for yourself, maybe in your neck of the woods, wherever that may be. And so I'm headed back home now. I'm gonna hike back to the car. I'm probably about four hours from home if I drive straight there, but I think I am gonna go drive over Calamity Mountain on the way. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think. Let me know what your favorite part was. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll see you in the next one. Be sure to check out Adventure Know How, my new site, where you can gain access to a map of all of my free campsites, plus monthly bonus videos that you won't find anywhere else. Learn more at adventureknowhow.com. And for links to everything else SUV RVing related, visit suvrving.com. Links to these sites and more will be in the video description.